Hi everyone, my name is Claire Tomlin. I'm a professor of electrical engineering and computer sciences at Berkeley. And this is um, module 31 in a series that we're recording to support the course EECS 221A, which is linear system theory at Berkeley. Module 31 introduces you to the concepts of stability, internal stability, so state space stability. In the last module, we talked about bounded input, bounded output stability and the characterizations of that for linear time varying and linear time invariant systems. And so in this module, we'd like to now generalize to state space stability. So um, we use the terminology state space, stability, interchangeably with internal stability. And I think the idea is that it is in contrast to input-output stability, which is kind of looking at the system from the outside, looking at the inputs, inputs that are applied and then the outputs that are measured, we can try to characterize the or assess the stability of the system. Um, internal stability is to do with the internal states. And as we know, the states are, um, they could be uh, variables that are hidden from the input and output. So we really go and we look at the, the modes of the system, meaning the, the, the state values and how they change over time to assess whether or not the system is internally stable. When it comes to internal stability, we have different, I would say, grades of stability, different definitions, um, and uh, each more stringent about how we define stability of the system. So this module is just to introduce these different definitions, these different concepts of stability. Okay, so we'll start with um, state-space stability definitions. And we're going to be dealing, so these, these definitions are general for systems. Uh, however, we will be focusing on linear systems, in general, linear time varying systems. And um, we're going to ignore the inputs for now. I mean, the input is in general important, but to um, assess the, the internal stability of the system, it really focuses on properties of this matrix A of T. Okay, so we know that for this, X of T, the solution can be written in terms of the state transition matrix and the initial state. Um, before we start with the definitions of stability, we're going to define the concept of an equilibrium point. So an equilibrium point Xe, equilibrium point, is a state, a state value at which, um, at which A of T times Xe is equal to zero, uh, is equal to the zero vector. So that means that if you're at a value Xe, then X dot is equal to zero, meaning that the system state won't change. So that means that if, you, if you're at an equilibrium point, the system will stay at that equilibrium point. And that's really the definition. Of, it's a, a point of rest or um, a steady state value of the system. Um, we, for a linear system, zero is always an equilibrium point. So zero is always an equilibrium for this linear system. That's just because um, a of t times zero is always equal to, ze to zero. But there may be other equilibria in this system. So if we have a linear system, let's just sketch something in the plane. Suppose I have two states, x1 and x2. I know that zero is always an equilibrium point. So if uh, the system starts at zero, it will stay at zero. Suppose there's another equilibrium point, um, let's call it Xe, which is over here, then from the properties of the linear system, just from the linear algebra, we know that um, everything between zero, everything on the line which connects zero and Xe is also an equilibrium point because the equilibrium points have the structure that they're in the null space of the matrix A of t for all t, and that's a subspace. So if these two points are in that subspace, then since it's a subspace, everything on that line has to be in um, an equilibrium point. It has to be in the null space of A of T. 
Okay, so generally um, we talk about the equilibrium at zero, and we talk about stability of that equilibrium at zero. But it doesn't have to be at zero. I mean, we could be talking about stability of this line of equilibria, for example. Um, where it becomes important to differentiate between um, the equilibrium point, which is non-zero, and the equilibrium point at zero is more for nonlinear systems, where you could have multiple isolated equilibria. So you can never have an isolated equilibrium of a linear system away from zero just for this reason, that if this is an equilibrium point, and we always know this is an equilibrium point by the structure of the equation, everything in between has to be an equilibrium point. In nonlinear systems, that's not the case, and you can have multiple isolated equilibria, and each, the system could be stable with respect to one and unstable with respect to another. So in linear systems, we typically say, without loss of generality, let's assume the equilibrium point is at zero, and we'll talk about stability about that equilibrium at zero. Okay, so what are our definitions of stability? The first is stability, or internal stability. So from now on, I'm gonna drop the word internal, and really, when we refer to stability, if we don't specify bounded input, bounded output stability, stability typically means internal stability, relative to the state space of the system. Okay, so the definition is as follows. So definition, um, xe equals zero is stable, meaning it's internally stable, if and only if, for all initial conditions x0 in Rn, and for all t0, so initial times, um, the map which takes t to x of t, which is defined by phi of t, t0, x0, is a bounded map, is bounded for all t greater than or equal to t0. Okay, so the, basically that's just saying that x of t remains bounded, i.e. that x of t is less than some finite constant m for all t. Okay, so it's not a very strict definition. In fact, if this were our example here, and so let's just continue with our example in the plane. Let's consider stability with respect to this equilibrium point at zero. Um, here's our initial state, say. Um, anything that you know, goes like this, it doesn't have to approach the equilibrium. You know, it's, as long as it stays bounded, okay? So it can't go off to infinity, but as long as that trajectory stays bounded, then the system is said to be stable. Okay, so basically you need some uh, constant m, so let's think about that as some circle of radius m, which keeps the, such that that trajectory always remains within m for all time. Okay, so it's a very weak definition of stability. The next definition is that of asymptotically stable. Okay, so whereas stability doesn't require the trajectory to converge to the equilibrium point, asymptotic stability does. Definition, xe is asymptotically stable. So we always talk about stability with respect to an equilibrium point. Uh, if and only if, first of all, we have to say that that equilibrium point is stable. So first of all, it has to be stable. And then, and the trajectory x of t is equal to phi of t comma t0 x0 converges to that equilibrium at 0 x e as t gets large, as t goes to infinity. Okay, so the, the definition of asymptotic stability first requires boundedness of the state trajectory, and then in addition requires that the state trajectory converge to the equilibrium point as t goes to infinity. Okay, so it's not actually enough just to say the second part in that definition. 
if you just defined asymptotic stability to be that the trajectory converged to the equilibrium as t goes to infinity, you could get cases like this. Let's just do a 1D case. Here's x of t. So you could get a trajectory which goes off to infinity in finite time, and then it comes back down. So it goes off to infinity, and then it comes back down and converges to our equilibrium, x e, as t goes to infinity. And we don't want to allow trajectories to have what's called finite escape time and then come back down for asymptotic stability. So we um, rule that out by first requiring that the system be stable about that equilibrium point. OK, second definition of stability. So this, this definition actually requires that the trajectory converge to the equilibrium point as t goes to infinity. But it doesn't say anything about the rate of convergence. So it never gets there, but it may actually you know, converge and get there very, very slowly. OK, so, so our third definition of stability, our third and last definition, relates to the rate of convergence. So the final definition is that of exponential stability. Definition, x e is said to be exponentially stable exponentially stable if and only if there exists constants if and only if there exists constants let's call them m and alpha these are positive real constants such that and here we have the rate of convergence such that the norm of x of t can be bounded above by a decaying exponential which is parameterized by alpha and m times the initial, the norm of the initial state. Okay, so what this one is saying is that x of t, for, and this is for all t greater than or equal to t0, so the norm of x of t is less than or equal to a decaying exponential. So these are positive constants. They could be large, but they're positive constants times the initial state. So it allows us to have, in particular, trajectories which are converging to the equilibrium point. Not, um, they're not converging as decaying exponentials, but they converge in such a way that they can be bounded above by decaying exponentials. So returning to our 1D case, here's t, here's um, x of t. So something that looks like something that's converging to an equilibrium point like that can be bounded above. So if we think about a decaying exponential here, we're allowed to affect both the initial value, so that's multiplied by x0. So here's x0, which is given to us. So by manipulating m and alpha, we can come up with some decaying exponential such that x of t is always bounded, the norm of x of t is always bounded below that decaying exponential for appropriate m and alpha. So you can see m will affect the, the um, the intercept on that on the y-axis there. Alpha is called the rate of convergence. So it's a bound, in this case, it's a bound on the rate of convergence. And uh, you can see that we didn't need to additionally qualify this definition by first requiring x of t to be stable, because this already takes care of the fact that that trajectory is bounded. If it's bounded below a decaying exponential, it's got to be bounded below some constant value. OK, so we have three definitions of stability. We have systems that are stable, internally stable. So here's the set of stable systems, say. And then a more stringent condition is uh, asymptotically stable, asymptotically stable. And then a more stringent condition to that is exponentially stable. OK, so the set of exponentially stable systems is contained within the set of asymptotically stable systems, which is contained within the set of stable systems. 
For linear time and or for linear time varying systems, these two sets, the sets of asymptotically stable and exponentially stable systems, are different from each other. But for linear time invariant systems, we can easily show that the set of asymptotically stable systems, so um, the set of systems L, which are asymptotically stable, asymptotically stable, is equal to the set of um, linear systems L which is exponentially stable. Okay, so for a linear time invariant system, an asymptotically stable system is automatically exponentially stable. And we'll show, we'll show that. Okay, so, so in this module, we just wanted to introduce you to the concepts of, of, of stability, the, the definition. So stability, asymptotic stability, and exponential stability, and give you some intuition about what that means in terms of the trajectory decay of those systems. Now, in the subsequent modules, we're going to come back and do the obvious thing. We'll go back to the system models and try to characterize from the models themselves when a system is, falls into one of these three cases of stability. Okay, thanks very much.